Uh, well, my name is Justin Fleming. I am 24. I live in uh, Michigan, in kind of like the suburbs of uh, Detroit in uh, the United States. Um, some people might know me online by my alias, The Typer, which is something I've gone by for a long time. But um, I was kind of, I contacted you to really, well, for starters, mainly just because I love reading the site and I really like the conversations on there. And as on a personal note, like I've always kind of wanted to be, for a long time I thought game journalism would be the thing I wanted to do with my life, but really I realized um, doing all the hunting down and the boring news stories that you don't really care about, I really wanted more to just talk critically about video games. And Don't Die seemed like this excellent vehicle to do so. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I find, think back on our... Thread. I mean, I think it had a, a had an air of, um, it, you know, it was sort of like two writers sort of talking about writing. I mean, I, I wasn't quite sure, like, if you had reached a conclusion of, like, you know, you, you don't want to go into writing. It seemed to me like a lot of what you were talking about is sort of um, trying to find community in video games mm -hmm. online. Yeah. Um, sure. You know, when I when I reread your stuff yesterday, and just thinking back from the first, you know, like one of the first things you said was sort of about just the way people act in communities online. So mm -hmm. this is a very nebulous, abstract thing, as most of the questions in here tend to be. But uh, I mean, what does community mean to you um, around video games, and like, what do you think it means to you versus what it seems to mean for most people you run into? Hmm. Um, for like for the average Joe, I guess uh, video game community is going to look like. Um, like if if it's an average person who plays an MMO like uh, World of Warcraft, or even uh, my girlfriend and I who uh, we we both pass time, we both pay, play Candy Crush on our phones when we're bored. Mm -hmm. um, a community community seems to be just the sense of connection um, be, between individuals surrounding a video game. Uh, the Dark Souls series has an entire community, and most of that community is either really engaged in what they do in the game together, or they're really engaged. Uh -huh in the game itself so the uh the souls community is engaged heavily in um t uh, disassembling what certain things about the game mean or uh, almost a critical breakdown of what certain characters are uh, it, i mean the dark souls series is really vague so that's that's one route i think i get when it comes to gaming community uh, there's tons of youtube channels that and people and forums that just discuss what one video game and all the little facets and details in it uh, are. I get that sense of community with video games. That's kind of the, something that I explore. Um, and then a sense further for me on like a personal level um, when it comes to writing or talking or discussing or uh, if, I d if I had the time to devote to it, building YouTube videos about it. Um, I am somebody who s I seek critical discussion on video games almost constantly. I, and finding ways to talk about video games like I hate I hate to sound like snobbish but like I, I want to talk about video games in general and look at something deeper and like mm -hmm. I have so many friends that kind of like uh, I'll talk about something for 15-20 minutes about like one little element of a game and they'll just be like yeah that's cool <laughs> or you know they'll just be like you're looking way too deep into it I'm like I'm pretty sure it's there for a reason one of my favorite examples is Spec Ops the Line I'm sure you've heard tons of people talk about the various different things in that game that are mm -hmm. uh, metaphorical uh, you know uh, going downwards as a uh, metaphor for uh, the, the sinking feeling that people have who have PTSD and you know my friends are just like no nah, it's probably just like lazy it's just it's the game I'm just like no it's, it's there it's there for a reason and it's I've found I've found some good communities but most of it seems to be from people who create trying to build communities from the, for themselves YouTube creators uh, again back to the Dark Souls thing YouTube channels build their own communities of people who follow what they create so that they can have a community and I don't know that seems like too much effort for me I'd rather just be able to talk to somebody on a one-to-one -one basis yeah or it, even just like in a, a small group chat on Skype um, but it's it's feels like pulling teeth to try and get enough people interested it, it's well it's, like there's fandom and then there's critical discussion and fandom is really easy to find yeah, this is, I mean, this was sort of the next thing I, I wanted to ask was, I mean, why why do you think it's so difficult to find and for people who don't, you know, who can't meet you there, like, why why is that important? 
Um, for me, it's important just because, I don't know, I'm obsessed with it or something. I do the same thing with music. Like, I, I, I follow a smaller amount of artists than somebody who's really into music would, but those few artists, I, like, obsess over their work and try to figure out what everything means. It's just something I really like doing. And so maybe for me, it's really important just because it, I, I'd like to have somebody to talk to and say similar, interesting, but different things back to me. Um, and as for why fans and video game players out there aren't having the similar response, it's hard to say. Like, I mean, a lot of your interviews, a lot of people mention something along the lines of you hit a certain age, priorities happen in life, and mm-hmm. you know, video games are a very, very deep time sink, so it's it's not always something you can always keep up with for sure. Uh, and like, I agree. I mean, I can only really dedicate myself to video games and music. I don't have, I barely take time to read books. Well, I mean, do you feel like you're, uh, is it a race against the clock in a way? I mean, like, do you feel like when you hear these things or <laughs> even when you read them on, on, on this, you know, like, do you feel like, you know, you need to find your community before you hit a certain age or else it's just never going to happen? I definitely don't have that feeling, for sure. Okay, that, that, good. I never thought about that. But oh, yeah, Hopefully I, I didn't just give you that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, uh, like, I've got friends, and, I mean, like, I'm hitting, I'm in the weird transitionary phase of my life where I'm still in college, but I'm trying to get things figured out so that I can put myself in places where I want to be for um, the next long chunk of my life. And there's still friends who are sticking by me, still talking about video games, even though we haven't, you know, we have kids aren't in the picture yet or anything like that. But right. even then, I've heard, you know, people have kids and they play video games with their kids, and you know, there's there's ways to find balance. It seems if you don't go see movies, you can still play games with friends. Um, so I think it more personally, like I th- I tend to think it leads more to like maybe just problems in the way our culture currently is with video games and it's not like this mass giant problem or anything like that where it's not like an outbreak of video game uh video game video gamers being uncultured i i feel it's more this problem of just something that'll maybe slowly go away over time where we're still learning to treat video games as art or as something that can have a good critical discussion around it Mm. I mean, you had mentioned, um, I think like this was like the very top of the very first thing you sent me, you were talking mm-hmm. about um, being in spaces online where um, I think you, the way you put it was just that people were uh, waving, hand waving away, it. yeah, yep. hand waving away good yeah. thinking sources with a, hey, sorry, good thinking sources with a hand wave dismissal. Correct. So, I mean, I'm not asking for you to, uh, you know, name names of places or, or whatever, no. but I mean, like, where where are you seeing this happen? And um, I mean, I asked some yeah. of these questions too, which I didn't mention up top, but, you know, a lot of this is kind of aimed at, certainly I understand why, like, you know, hardcore, passionate fans of video games read this, but I also try to explain and contextualize a lot of stuff for people who have felt outside of video games gotcha. their entire lives. So, uh, yeah. I mean, you don't need to really mention the, <laughs> the, you but know, whether no, it's NeoGaf or wherever, mm-hmm. but like, uh, where, 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 though, yeah. Where, yeah, where where are you seeing this, and sort of what does that look like, and um, why is you know is that frustrating or is it not frustrating or is it something else yeah. altogether? The the last big forum that I uh, frequented in, in was technically it was like uh, I want to say three four years ago now. Uh, I I used to go frequent the Rooster Teeth forums. Most people know me on the internet through that somehow, or friends that I've established from the Rooster Teeths website in their forums and uh, there's a very distinct memory i have where like i was trying to bring up some some good talk about um i think it was about ea at the time or something some some bad movie ea did or something and i mm-hmm. everyone in the forum was discussing it and i just posted and i was like hey this reminds me of this video and i po- pulled up a, a video from uh, the extra credits library on youtube because extra credits has really good short five to ten minute videos that discuss concepts or discuss things about video games or right and wrong doings in the industry and it, it was relevant to this conversation and I one of the forum members said if that's a movie Bob uh, if that's a movie Bob YouTube video I'm not even going to watch it and it wasn't movie Bob at all it was extra credit so it's completely unrelated and I just that that moment and 
that moment really strikes out for me. It's, it was this moment where I realized that a lot of people, or I felt like a lot of people, have like an immediate bias or an immediate dismissal of something or somebody sometimes trying to bring forward that discussion with video games or I've I've felt it then and I've I feel like I felt it at other times too uh or like I I often I often call out the Call of Duty series um cuz I I used to love it but I I often call out for milking the same cow for far too long and not trying to be creative or try something different and you know friends of mine have argued counter that or just said you know it's just how it is or that it's that it's just you know it's your yearly blockbuster i'm just like yeah but you can i don't know i, I find it so bothersome if they keep doing the same thing over and over mm-hmm. uh, just a little bit different uh, you know you look at the changes in the call of duty series jumping from two or three to four uh, the first modern warfare one after a couple really good world war Two ones it was starkly good, and it wasn't just because it was modern warfare. It was because it was a really tight knit, well done story that's simple. Uh, it takes you a really good variety of places. It has somebody. Uh, somebody mentioned one of the probably one of the favorite Call of Duty four levels isn't even the most bombastic, intense, crazy one. It's the one where you're in a ghillie suit in Russia trying to avoid contact with enemies. You know, it's this stark contrast from what Call of Duty usually is. And that that says something, I think. I think that really speaks that Call of Duty can have things that are atypical to what it normally is and still feel like a Call of Duty game or a really good Call of Duty game. And so when people argue that, you know, you, it, there's not a crime in doing the same thing over and over again, personally, I feel it's just, I don't know, just it bothers me. <laughs> something about it bothers me. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a couple things, and one of them is, um, you know, if you have these opinions or these types of opinions, Mm -hmm. um, you run into these very brittle or uh, self-conscious or anxious or aggravated or angry sort of responses where you're sort of made to feel like, you know your your fandom or your devotion to the same thing is invalid because you drew a different conclusion or you feel a different right way. um and i sometimes think about this like i i this isn't probably too abstract but i think about it in mm-hmm. terms of like you know why why are there so many arguments about <laughs> video games online and like who are mm-hmm. who are the arbiters who get to decide like this is what a video yeah. game is and like mm-hmm. why does that argument even matter and why does it even seem to matter to them like when you when you come up against this and you know you try to bring up something a little bit more thoughtful you know in, in a forum or wherever like like what do you think is fueling that other side that is shouting you down, you know, whether it's from oh this came from a source I don't care about or something else. Like, what do you like? What do you think is fueling that? Um, I think it's ultimately a sense of elitism, even something that sometimes I do, and I'll admit that I, I'm a I pray victim to doing at times where it's just part of. I, th- I think it's part of like just a a cultural stance that mm-hmm. some people have grown to accept, take, or use. Um, just maybe it's a weird social dominance. It's kind of hard to place my finger on, like, why they have this stance, but I know that that stance is definitely real that you're talking about because, like, um, back to Dark Souls, there's there's critical discussions that say that Dark Souls 2 is the weakest in the Souls series. Even if you throw in Bloodborne and Demon Souls, Dark Souls 2, people will basically say that it's the weakest of the series. It disrespects the the built-in lore of the first game, and Dark Souls 3 still pays attention to that lore. Um, It's got gameplay problems that aren't there in the other games. It's built differently. Um, And so a lot of people do treat it like the game is just trash, which is very interesting because those same people probably have, because they do mention specific themes in the game, have spent plenty of time playing the game, and I've heard a really good argument that it may may be the worst of the series, but the Dark Souls series itself is this phenomenal um, event in video gaming in a way, and so like even the worst of a Souls game is still a really really good game. Mm-hmm. You know, ultimately it's like, it doesn't 
Like, that elitist stance of, like, oh, Dark Souls 2, somebody mentions it and they gotta say something cruel about it, is, it's, like, it's kind of funny. Maybe people are trying to be funny at times, but then at other times it feels like people are just uh, doing it to feel superior, maybe? I don't, like, I'm thinking to a lot of, a lot of discussions Movie Bob has brought forward about this, and he thinks, he personally thinks that a lot of this is coming from that's similar to the Gamergate scandal or stuff like that. It's a problem of video gamers from, uh, you know, before my time, really. Back, I mean, I was too young to be involved in this stuff, but when I'd say people who were teenagers around the time that the first Doom came out and Mortal Kombat was out, and there were all these controversies about, you know, violent video games, or um, who was that, that lawyer who tried to, like, ban video games or whatever? Jack Thompson. Uh, Right, right. You probably remember all about Jack Thompson. <laughs> I was trying to tell, like, whether you were trying to, if you were going to say yeah. people who are old and you didn't want, you didn't want to insult, <laughs> no, you're not no, going to insult me. But no, I'm I was not going to insult a, you. <laughs> I was a teenager at that time. I'm not going to be right. Honest. Yeah, it's it's just you've you were a bit more aware of what was going on during those times than I was. I was more like, oh, video games are awesome. Yeah, and you you were experiencing, yeah, video games are cool, and then your parents and the adults were going, video games are evil, and they're going to make you a terrorist. You know. <laughs> Um, yes. Or make you shoot up schools. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I think... So, like, Movie Bob believes that that community of gamers who had to endure this video games are bad for you type thing when they're not... Yeah. Um, ...had built up a defensive stance on it. Uh, but Movie Bob's argument is that we're past that, or we should be... We should m- mature past that now because it is very obvious video games are not some weird social controversy anymore. Jack Thompson got banned from ever being able to bring this, like, violent video games problem to the court anymore. It's not a problem. The Supreme Court ruled that video games are art, which means you can get a college education or uh, some sort of a grant, I believe, to design games. You can get money to build games because they're art. You know, there's... Everybody has a mobile phone and has what people will argue and debate on what is called a video game and I think if I think if you I think if you're debating over whether or not something is classified as a game then it's widespread enough for people to know that everyone plays them or uses them or it's it's an ex- widely accepted form yeah. which means that you know that we don't need to do a weird clubhouse defensive system anymore that's that's what movie bob thinks the problem is and I wouldn't be too surprised if that's kind of where these actions come from well they're definitely defensive um yeah. i mean it's too it's too broad to generalize about with like you know every mm-hmm. person is, is doing that but right um well so to to kind of to, to jump back i mean it, is that a, is that a thing that like you were figuring out or you were like trying to decide about like you know whether you wanted to become a writer in this space or you know by writer i you know i also include like you know making youtube videos or doing something else is that a thing that you were on the fence about when you first reached out to me or is that a thing you're not even really thinking about anymore i was on the fence about it before i reached out to you ages ago yeah um, we're not and ages i mean like you know three four years ago uh or like i graduated in high school around 2010 uh around those times I really did want to do stuff in writing the more and most of it came out of this uh this affinity for PC Gamer magazine the I actually was subscribed to the physical copies of it back then I listened to the podcast often and I don't know I thought it'd be really cool to and everyone you know, always everyone who thinks about video game journalism probably when they're young thinks you know it's sitting around and playing video games and reviewing them and Sure, you might get that chance, but you also sit down and play really horrible games and review those, and you're forced to write about it. But I, I, the writing process itself, I think, is something that I fell out of love with. It's something that I'll do if I'm really passionate and worked up about something. But I, I, it's very difficult for me to to work up the uh, what's the like the the energy and the persistence. And uh, to work up the energy to consistently write uh, articles, especially about stuff that may be just, you know, day-to-day video game business, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's something I I like to read every day. You know, I scroll through Feedly and check for articles and find out what's going on in the industry. But I would be a little bored following all that stuff and writing up 
stuff that's already technically been written or discussed about to some extent. And so it wasn't like the community at large or the social elitism problems that the culture is overcoming right now. It wasn't any of that stuff that like scared me away from or mm-hmm. pushed me away from writing about video games. It was more just me realizing I'd rather only work on stuff that I'm passionate about. So I, I tried to, for a while, do a Let's Play thing on YouTube. It was new, exciting, and me and my friends were, were having fun playing video games anyways. But that takes... <laughs> I almost feel like that takes more work than it does to write about video games. <laughs> Probably. I gotta do all, all this video editing, getting people together to play video games, making sure everybody has the same copy of the game, recording, editing. Ugh, it's I, I tried it for a year or two. And you know it was fun, but it's it's a lot of work. Were you doing it with the intent of like you know you thought you'd be able to support yourself on it, or you'd be able to earn money off of it, or were you just doing it for some other reason? It, it, it was fun first or uh, interesting first. It was um, I built it was in 2012. I built a new machine, new PC, and I said you know what I've never had a computer that runs so well that I can record video and play a game with a decent frame rate. I I feel like I uh I might be wrong on this, but I feel like my age group somewhere like maybe plus or minus 2 years in my age group or between 22 and 26 year olds right now are probably some of the last generations of people who in America I think might live on or have experienced crappier technology before like everything just works these days <laughs> everything just runs games well these days these days it feels mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. you know it, you run into the problem of just it's dated instead of your computer just doesn't have the technology requirements so anyways i i ran this i ran a game of left 4 dead 2 hopped on with uh, two of my friends online recorded it it was funny and i said you know what maybe i should start trying to upload videos regularly maybe we can do that it was I don't. I almost never any of my creative pursuits, uh, whether I'm making a, a electronic mixes, which I I do that. Uh, if I'm doing YouTube stuff or if I'm writing about video games, and I still do any of that stuff, I always approach it with the rule of thumb: getting success in this is not necessarily easy. And so I'd rather go for a career where I've got a bit more of a certainty at success. So it was. It was. I always approach them with, "Hey, if I'm if I somehow become massively successful, awesome." But I don't plan for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. You had mentioned. Um, so you're in college, and you mentioned that you mm-hmm. sort of you were on the fence about this a while ago. So I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm sure you've heard millions of times. But uh, what are you hoping to do? <laughs> uh, with myself? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm 24 now, so I've heard that question. I'm sure. Long enough ago for me to not be as bored by it. No. Good. I'm. A, I'm. In college, I got an associate's degree in networking. It's something my dad taught me, and um, he said you've got a knack for you know computers and technology, and it'd be a, probably be a good path to take it. And I said okay, so I took got got an associate's in network administration around the time when basically everyone was being told you should get a bachelor's. And I said, well, I'll get the associate's anyways, and that was a really good eye opener for what software and stuff is used in networking environments. And I said. I like this, for sure. There's things that appealed to me, different courses that I said, I like doing this, or I like using this piece of software, and I said, well, maybe I'll pursue that for a career. Um, down the road a bit, as I thought about it more, I said, well, maybe I won't always want to do that. You know, I hear people have multiple careers in one lifetime, typically, and if that's the case, then I'd like to keep my possibilities a bit more open. So instead of pursuing a, a bachelor's in computer science, which is typically what your computer area turns into for bachelor's these days, it's not networking bachelor's, it's computer science of some sorts. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of that, I said, well, I'll get, a, I'll get a bachelor's in business. That's what I'm pursuing right now, business administration. I'll take a couple of courses after I get that, and I'll get a second bachelor's specializing in management. Um, and I did that mainly because my stepmother, who uh, she passed away earlier this year, my stepmother had a degree in that, and she got jobs. She could get jobs anywhere, you know. She could get and better offers every single time she sought out a new job. She was she worked in supply chain management here in Michigan, so that means cars essentially. Yeah. Um, but I realized that a bachelor's degree, if you're in business, uh, that means you can kind of apply business 
management in a lot of fields and a lot of different scenarios. I could be managing video game stuff. I could be managing non-video game stuff. And so I wanted to use, that's what I'm working towards. And I want to use that to kind of pursue anything. And all that way I can always have these games, music, creative pursuits for myself. And if they ever take off, then hey, maybe I'll chase them. But, hmm. you know, for now I'm just going to keep doing them and if there's an audience for what I what I like to do creatively um, I hope I find them one day that'll be awesome is that a thing that uh, and with these conversations I'm not advocating mm-hmm. for people to play more games or to be in the industry is that a thing that's in the back of your head like you're kind of keeping your options open but you're like you wouldn't rule out working in the game industry is that right yeah um, in some way shape or form probably not directly making video games like i've seen how the sausage is made thanks to the double fine documentary oh it's so such a good documentary mm-hmm. um and you know that's really awesome i would definitely work something leaning more towards video game i guess we call it, you can call it coverage now if you're not an actual journalist like you might be as from what i see in your uh your work history if you're not an actual journalist then you know coverage you know but how people, how YouTube channels or gaming channels these days just talk about video games, podcasts, YouTube videos, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not something I've ruled out entirely. Gotcha. Well, so yeah, I don't want to ask you too many questions that are down a hypothetical path, but I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, I think you know when I think of like the best or the most interesting gaming coverage it tends to dovetail with like other aspects of life like you know do you like business do you like philosophy do you like labor do you like art do you like science like what are what are things that like you know you feel like you would like to or you have or you want to continue to sort of you know infuse with uh covering video games um it would be along the lines probably of those critical discussions you know uh looking at it from an artistic perspective and and then probably just news, um, like the workings between developers and publishers, things that happen there, because I think that's a, I think that's a private room in the industry that, like, I understand why it's private, but I, almost, I really wish there was more out there for people to understand what's going on. Like, I feel like if things were more transparent, then. I'm not saying like all the problems in the world would go away because Tim Schafer's problems developing a broken age did not go away um, when things were transparent for him or when things were uh, excluded for him. He had difficulties on both sides of the fence, but like that's something I would well, pr- try to cover as much as I could. I know if like if I had like a weekly podcast, I would have probably a talk section where I pick a game with somebody and we get to have at it for 30 minutes and tear it apart and talk about everything that works and doesn't and then there'd be a thing where i talk about what's happening between certain developers or publishers like if uh, uh there was something up today um valve software and hello games they got they're being pulled into uh some conversations with like uh, the yeah uh, i think it's a british advertising like it's basically their version of the better business bureau Right, right. They're being the pulled ASA. into stuff because yeah, yeah, the SA. Yeah, they're being pulled into stuff because uh, supposedly the No Man's Sky trailers that are still up on Steam are not uh, a good representation of the of the product that people are buying. You know, stuff like that. I'm very interested in because I think that's that's ultimately like if you're looking at both sides of what makes people happy when it comes to video games and how to better that. It's you know the people who make the products and then. Our understanding of the product. Well, I mean, it's 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 not funny, haha, but it's funny because uh, I mean, you mentioned like it won't fix all the problems, but I do think mm-hmm. like a very strong source of problems is um, it's almost like too it's almost overstating it to say that these companies aren't transparent, as if like there was something sinister going on. But <laughs> but I do think, and I've written and I've talked, and I'm sure you've read me talk about this before a great amount. You know, like there is. That silence is a great canvas onto which a lot of assumptions are being made by 
um, you know, some of the more vocal and some of the more mm-hmm. toxic portions of the game's audience mm-hmm. where, you know, in the case of a No Man's Sky, you have, you know, it was it was uh, it was released. And then you have a thing on Reddit where someone is like, here's all the things that's wrong with it. And here's how, quote unquote, easy it would be to fix it. And here's how it happened mm-hmm. to be exactly like the way it was pitched. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I had my heads down on so much stuff. I didn't even realize that it happened with Valve today. You mentioned them before yeah, as an it was example. A short article I read. Yeah, you mentioned them as an example of a company that like used to be much more vocal, and then they they can't as much anymore. So, right. Uh, I mean, what are the sorts of things? Because you, I mean, I have a longer memory of this stuff just because I've been alive longer than you. But yeah, yeah. But what sort of stuff do you feel like you used to be able to to read about or have eyes on that like you just can't anymore from game companies? Um, hmm. it, it can be anything. I mean, or I like I feel like. Personally, I since you you are right because I didn't really start paying attention to the conversations developers and publishers were having or stuff like you know uh, Valve coming under scrutiny with the ASA. I didn't re- start noticing that stuff uh, that you catch on Gama Sutra or Rock Paper Shotgun until I was about seventeen or eighteen. Yeah. So before then, I just remember being able to read in PC Gamer magazine and seeing on TV uh, E three pre- press coverage where. You know, it's the the interviewee. It's you talking to me, Gabe Newell and Doug Lombardi, the spokesperson for Valve. Right. As w- and one of them is playing the game on a TV screen that feeds to the TV that everyone in the world can watch, and it shows the gameplay. And they talk about the game and the products that they're shipping a bit more upfront. I don't. I mean, that's probably a a bad word. A bit more. Straightforward, I guess you could say. And up front sounds like they're trying to hide something, but it's just straightforward. <laughs> Here's what we're building. <laughs> yeah. We hope you like it. Yeah. This is what it's like. Uh, the interviewee might have a few questions about the game, uh, thinking about the product in mind that the players might like or the product that the interviewee is excited about. And, you know, that happens. And these days, you see so much less of it. Um, I feel, at least. I feel like d- developers now, they'll release their own video gameplay demo like uh, Dark Souls 3 had different demos that leaked from uh, their development house in Japan that got put up on YouTube and it showed some of the gameplay and it was actually fairly accurate representations of the gameplay uh-huh. and no one talked about what was going on in the game the the writers had to write about what happened and just make another article for people to read in case they don't want to spend the time watching the video and that was it no one I mean there's there's some interviews that the people get to have with uh, the Souls developer, the the director of it, uh, Miyazaki. Right. Some people get to. So there's interviews with them, um, but like you look at Valve today. Uh, I mean, you said it yourself, and uh, it's something that we we talked about in the email these days. Um, you know, anyone asks Gabe Newell about Half Life Three, um, there's there's even mentions of this in articles where Doug Lombardi, there's the, the spokesperson for Valve, essentially their their PR guy. Will turn will tur- shake his head. Like Gabe Newell will look at Doug Lombardi after being asked about Half Life, and Doug Lombardi shakes his head. It's like, no, you can't. Why? Uh, I, their reasoning is it causes disappointment, which I understand for a game that's being delayed that much. But you know, even if just a little bit of talking about it. Well, I mean, might. you mentioned it yourself. I mean, I don't think that this No Man's Sky thing is. I'm not really one one for hypotheticals and predictions, but mm-hmm. I really don't. I mean, it will be interesting <laughs> if <laughs> if something comes of it. It's yeah. just kind of. I mean, I'm curious to. I would. I would love to read how things precipitated to get to that level. Right. But, yeah. But but I think you know. I think understandably, there's an aversion to making false or what will turn out to be empty promises. Yep. I think that the other problem is that like every conversation, typically from a game developer or a game publisher. Mm-hmm. Or, understandably is about selling something that there isn't yep. this it's it's i mean i've talked about this elsewhere like i just i feel like you know we're at this place where the industry is kind of afraid of the audience that it built up and i think you know no man's sky would be another example of just like a yet yet another way to be afraid mm-hmm. of your audience um mm-hmm. i mean there's a lot of specifics maybe getting things that are you know specific to that to that yeah. but but I, but I, I mean, do you ever get that sense that like you know the industry maybe is like afraid of its audience? I think yeah, it's like maybe not afraid of the audience, but afraid of essentially losses of some sort. Like, 
Um, mm. So, like, ultimately, unless I haven't dug around the internet hard enough, which is totally possible, I don't, I skim. Um, you mean you don't read all of the internet every day? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't go to NeoGAF, I, I'll tell you that much, or Reddit, I don't touch Reddit either. Yeah. Um, and I definitely don't touch 4chan. <laughs> um, you look at No Man's Sky, and... Like people are very vocal about like how they think it could have easily be fixed, and that argument set aside, we don't ultimately know what happened. We just know the director was saying you can do these things in the game. We saw these things in trailers. Things are different at launch, and we don't know if it's Sony clamping down, cutting out features, and saying we got to push this game out now. We're running out of money, or if it's a thing of um, the director was just blatantly lying and the footage was fake or if it was x y or z we really don't know what happened there Mm -hmm. and i think um maybe the culture of people who are so defensive maybe hop onto scenarios where there's there's no answers and that creates problems i think uh yeah rock paper shotgun had a really good article probably a couple years back now um a really good follow-up article like a, a couple months after ea's gigantic problem at launching uh, SimCity, the new SimCity. Oh, right. Like, there was tons of problems, and I think John Walker or maybe Alec Meir on Rock, Paper, Shotgun explained that eventually the whole drama and all the problems that EA were facing and probably losses with returns or something like that, all those problems just kind of went away and were silenced because EA more or less just clamped shut. Like, there was a couple people who mentioned a few things and then those people were no longer working or no longer talking to any press at all about what was going on and where the problems came from, which is really, I think, would actually help people ultimately unless the answers are something really bad, but I'm not a crazy conspiracy person like that. I'm not thinking that all publishers are evil or that you know their all their interests are just in screwing over the customers. That doesn't work. But I think too. I mean, not not to be contrarian. I mean, I think like I can understand from their perspective. Like, I mean, it used to be somewhat contentious. Like, you know, is there such a thing as games journalism? And I think mm-hmm. I think that gets into into murky territory. And I don't really want to dissect the semantics of it. But it's like, right? I mean, it, as you mentioned yourself, like, it, and as we're sort of hinting at, it, it's kind of hard to be a conventional journalist in this yes. space because a lot of the writing and a lot of the way that the industry works is, um, you know, it's about covering marketing. But like, <laughs> there's someone I talked to who, who used to work at this game, not not this game company, but a mm-hmm. game company in the UK, mm-hmm. and he, you know, he used to work in. Um, he used to work in finance, and he told me that the game industry is more secretive than than the <laughs> than the finance world. I mean, Which, I, that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, I've heard all sorts of things with this with this project, but I think like something that like I haven't really explored or that I haven't really talked about with other people that much is like, I mean, on the on the one hand, it's like yeah, there's a lot of legitimate like stories that could be told and that should be written about, and it's not as though like the press has to quote unquote earn that trust it's just that i don't know that like it's ever functioned in that way where they have had it from game companies i mean i I think about it Mm. beyond that as far as just like you know games media being you know nintendo power and things like that and so you know starting off being you know in one form or another in bed with companies and they're much more separate now but I, but I still think it's true that like I don't think there are many quote unquote journalists in the space who understand how business works, much less like right. how the media business works. I mean, do you feel like that's an unfair uh, claim to make? It sort of does to some extent. Like now that I think about it more, it's like yeah, to some extent because maybe it was one in one of your your interviews, or maybe it was. Um, in an old podcast, when back when I list, used to listen to PC Gamer podcast, mm-hmm. um, somebody said at some point that the journalists or that the people who write the preview columns on video games are looking to es- keep or establish a good relationship with the developers or the publishers who allow you know the de- people to go to the developing houses right. and look at these games, and that seems. Like a crazy like now that you mention it this way, mm-hmm. it is a little like it almost feels backwards. Like, <laughs> I, like 
like yeah. the more I've the, as I've grown up and I've learned a bit more about well, like what real true journalism is and like people who you know go overseas and you know face danger because they're trying to get information that somebody is trying to keep shut you know and that's that's kind of why earlier I said like I started thinking it's like it's more like coverage these days of you know, yeah of marketing that still leaves the publishers and the developers in the control of what stories do get told if EA just clamps shut then there's nothing to tell there's nothing to report on there's nothing to uh, talk about I don't know I mean people will do it's, some pretty impressive you know like undercover reporting or yeah, uh, right. you know they do reporting from behind you know war you know entering war behind mm-hmm. enemy lines they do I, I think I think the thing that maybe we're not saying but it, I doubt it even needs to be said is <laughs> There's just not a lot of money in this stuff. Um, I, I think uh, I think the average. This is just uh, just anecdotal, but I think mm-hmm. I think the average amount of time of uh, you know if people are trying to go full bore f- full time into writing about games and that's all they mm-hmm. want to write about, they typically just because there aren't that many jobs, they'll they'll they'll, they'll burn out and move on in in yep. two years. And so that's not to say. That only people who are freelance are able to write these types of stories, but the people who are in-house <laughs> aren't yeah, writing it's... these stories either. So, right. uh, I mean, like, I, I guess you know, these are things that 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 I know, and I'm sure you know. But for people who don't know, like, what are the kinds of things that, like, you know, what are the kinds of journalism you see elsewhere that you feel like you just never see in games? Um, there was an article. I don't know why I read it, but oh, I, I remember now. Um, it was around the time Apple did their stuff with uh, the with what was it the when they said no, you can't, we're not going to build you a a hack for the iPhone that can be used on all iPhones across the world. Um, when Apple did that, I remember those a statement made by John McAfee. I don't remember what about, but then I went and looked up because I remember a coworker once told me John McAfee's crazy the father or the director creator of McAfee Internet Security. So I looked up um, an, an old interview from somewhere in the past six years with John McAfee where somebody flew overseas, uh, had small random times where they were able to sit down with John McAfee and talk about the stuff he was doing. And sometimes those contacts were just randomly by cell phone very briefly. Like those, there, there was a couple lawn interviews that the journalist had with McAfee and then he reported on how once or twice John McAfee called him up on his cell phone while he was like at a sports event or something while he was at home and he heard from John McAfee that like there's a bunch of dudes uh, from the local government like the local police government or something in boats around this island he was on, living on with arms and everything and they were just sitting there staring at John McAfee for a while um, or the the journalist talked about how John McAfee held a gun that he th- thought he saw was clearly loaded. He held it to his own head, pulled the trigger twice, nothing happened. And John McAfee turned the gun towards the sand and shot and fired a round off. You don't hear stuff like that in the video game industry. And some of that, I think, is just because, well, it's video games. It's, I mean, it, it does have probably some, you know, crazy stuff going on. Things where, you know, like... Uh, uh, anonymous hacks into PlayStation's networks or Microsoft's networks, and we find out Microsoft agrees to send data from Xboxes and probably even connects to uh, our local government or our secure. Uh, was it the? I always forget. The NSA, yeah, the NSA. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that happens, and that is definitely you know some, a bit more exciting, interesting, or not as easy to obtain information that breaks out into the public um but it's still video games it's still it, it's movies it's marketing you know there's some crazy exciting things that happen but it's also kind of just this job like games coverage or journalism is this job that exists mainly because the market exists and so there's something to talk about there <laughs> 